Welcome to Inspired Changemakers, a podcast about all the amazing things people are doing to make the world a better place. This podcast is about creating change and the moments that inspired our guests to activate. My name is Julia Healy, and I'm the CEO of United Charitable. Stay tuned to be inspired. Donarian McCants, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, really, Inspired Changemakers is all about what people are doing to make changes and make changes in the world to make it a better place. And you are an ideal guest. Appreciate it. And I'm going to go into your background now or your bio. So born in Baltimore, Maryland, raised in Howard County, went to three different high schools, all state, vars- varsity lettered in football, basketball and track. And you actually like basketball more than football, right? Yes, I love basketball. <laughs> Walked on scholarship to Delaware State University, four years of football and track, fifth round draft choice of the Washington Redskins, now Commanders. You played four years with the Redskins and one year with E-A-G-L-E-S. the Eagles. <laughs> you have a Kids Choice Award. That I found out today, that's amazing. Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. Washingtonian of the year. You raised over 3,000 coats for displaced Americans during Hurricane Katrina. You're also an educator, personal trainer, mentor, father, husband, son, brother, and you're the founder of the Finding Me Foundation. Yes, that is I. That is you. Yes. Um, Welcome to the podcast. I really, again, I very much appreciate you being here. And I kind of want to start off with, what is your first memory of philanthropy? Um, that's community. Um, so east side of Baltimore, um, if anybody's lived in the city or any major city, you you got to take care of yourselves. So um, I grew up in a household of 12 people. I was the baby at the time. And, you know, I'm looking and watching what people do. If anything, if any kind of trouble happened in the city or within our blocks of the people we knew, my grandmother took care of them. So I had a whole bunch of cousins that I found out after 40 that really weren't cousins. It was like, oh, yeah, they lived across the street. Oh, no, they're really not family. They, you know, that we took care of them and they took care of us. And that was kind of how the community was built. So that's what I've always saw. Um, There's no separation from my community to my family. I'm going to treat you the exact same way. Right. I'm going to treat you with respect. I'm going to respect your property. Hopefully you respect my property and respect you as a person whatever you are, and hopefully you respect me as a person. And that's kind of how I've always been because that's what I saw. So it was times where I remember somebody knocking on the door, and my grandmother's name, Ethel Carter, and they called her Miss Sis, and uh, <clears throat> knock on the door, Miss Sis, um, we just got evicted. I need you to watch the kids. She never asked them how long or, you know, I need some money because obviously if you're getting evicted, you probably ain't got the money. Um, she take the kids in. she take the kids in. We, obviously, I was young, so I was always happy because they were probably most right. likely my age. Either I knew them, sometimes I didn't know them. Yeah. And he was like, oh, yeah, that's your cousins. Don't worry about it. That's, that's him and her, and we just go and play. We, we take care of them. And she would take the kids, bathe them, take care of them, feed them. And like I said, it was 12 people in the house. This is one woman in the 70s and 80s working two and three jobs. Crazy. So that's what I saw. Like, if anybody ever talked to me, I talk about my grandmother the most. Yeah. Because that's what I saw in those first seven years of a working woman, four sons, four daughters, three grandchildren. And she made it happen. We lived in a townhouse, you know, or a row house in the, in the city. And like I said, anytime somebody needed something, whether she had it or not, she would give it. And the one thing she always said, she said, only thing a child needs is love. Mm-hmm. All that other stuff, they don't need all half the stuff that people think, oh, we gotta give them this. And, and unfortunately, you know, when, when we become from poverty to well-to-do, we tend to spoil our kids and then wonder what's wrong with them. It's like, oh yeah, I've, I've given you this, I've given you that, why are you acting like this? Because they haven't earned anything. Right. They haven't seen the love factor of, hey, you have to be around something to give to get. Right. And like I said, those things you can't, you can't replace it. Like I said, I won't be remembered or I guess, the accolades won't be set until I'm passed away. Unfortunately, I was saying that just because of what I've seen from men. Right. It's like, oh, no, they hated him, they hated him, hated him, and then once he's dead, oh, he was so great. Right. So it's kind of to be expected, but as far as philanthropy, um, it's just the community, what I've seen, um, and how I was raised for the most part. And then how did <clears> you get into sports? 
I'm a boy. <laughs> um, had to do something. Uh, you know, just being a competitive nature. Uh, in the city, we would chase each other, tag up and down the street, playing street football, playing, you know, baseball, sticking a bat, uh, crate basketball. And then when I moved into the county, it was the only thing to really do because the county at the time didn't really have um, – youth sports right at least if they did i wasn't aware of them or my parents couldn't afford it right so we played basketball we, it, like we would go to elementary school we had everything there you had the basketball courts you had the, the soccer fields you had the baseball field and you were a better basketball player or football player i don't know if i was better at basketball i just love basketball more um if anything i was just a better athlete okay um so what i say to myself now just watching and knowing my game yeah i'm just going to out athlete you so whatever position you play I'm going to be a better athlete at it like when I played basketball when I had to play the city kids some of them jokers was six 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 ten seven feet I was six two what am I going to do with that right you know besides get dunked on um <laughs> you know and then of course obviously if I went to college for basketball I think my game would have changed and transitioned to my natural position yeah which is like a two three shooting guard small forward style um, because I could jump, I was an athlete, I was strong, and I was aggressive. Yeah. So if you think D-Wade, yeah. that was kind of my game, okay. mid-range. Um, but then as far as football, I was huge. Right. 6'2", 190 pounds in high school. Um, and I ran a 4'5", 4'4", in high school. And in college, you know, pros, I, went, I was down to a 4'3". Um, so it was just inevitable to an extent. It made more sense to go football because, like I said, the next biggest guy might have been 180 pounds. Right. So I just bully people. So then, so you kind of, again, were a gifted athlete all through your childhood. I'm going to say I worked at it. I don't want to say I'm gifted. I worked. Yeah. I was small. I wasn't big. Like, that's the part. That's what I was telling you about myself. I, I was small. I was, my freshman year, I was 5'8", 130 pounds. It's crazy. It wasn't until my mother allowed me to lift weights. And so where do you think you got that work ethic, though? Like, that just doesn't come, right? Like, where do you think you've gotten that mentality or that work that you or that discipline to put put into your, I mean, starting at an early age? I don't know. That's the, I, I, I asked that question myself because I don't like losing. I don't know why. <laughs> But I don't like losing at anything. Like, it's not till now that I, I have to calm myself down to it. Like, I was playing basketball the other day, and there was a young lady on the court, and she, like, undercut me. And I could feel my flame light up. Now, have you, she's 5'5". Five, five. <laughs> right. She's not, a, you know, that's not a, something I should be. Yeah. But something was like, all right, now it's time to play ball. Yeah. And that's what it's always been. It was like if something was adverse or, yeah. it, you know, and then it, it was an outlet, too. You know, because I can't say everything was my liking at my home. So that was my escape. I can get out. I can do something. And then you get praise when you are good at something as well. Right. And so so were you always in the gym, like even as like a young kid? Um, It started when I was nine because I stayed in trouble. So I'm going to say I was mischievous more than I was bad, but I was practicing on being, being a criminal. Okay. I was breaking into houses. Uh, stealing bikes. Like I said, it was a city mindset. The, right. s the city mindset was just don't get caught. Yeah. And if you get caught, don't tell. That was, I was right. bringing that into a different environment. Okay. Until, like I said, my guy Todd Beasley, I don't know if he ever remember if he's still alive, but he asked me one day, he was like, why do you steal bikes? And I had no answers. Because <laughs> you could. And you, right. Yeah. If you left a bike out, you know, because like I said, in the city, everything was locked down. Right. So when I went to county, People would leave bikes anywhere because yeah. they had the money and the funds and they really didn't pretty much care. Right. You know, so I see, a, you know, at that time, the Huffy, I see a Huffy laying around. I pick it up and ride it. And it's not like I wanted it or brought it home. I would just drop it off in the woods or leave it somewhere else to where I could go get it. So if anything, it was a mentality, um, you know, and then, like I said, I think in a city also, when you come from a impoverished mindset, it's more survival. Right. So it's what am I going to do to win today? What do I have to do to get to this today. And so what did he ask you? He asked you why. Yeah, he just simply, it was Todd Beasley, straight. like I said, complete opposites. Yeah. Little small, blonde. Think about, uh, Mr. what was it? Dennis the Menace. Yeah. That's what he looked like. Oh my God. He looked like the kid from Dennis the Menace. Little small, scrawny kid. And he was like, hey, why do you steal bikes? And now I say that also because my brother at the time, um, Raina Matthews, was the number one BMX rider in the nation. Oh, that's awesome. And he was probably the first black guy in the profession as well when they was just starting to make it a profession we had a multitude of bikes you're like you didn't need it my whole shed was full of bikes of bikes that nobody even heard of right 
and you know, and then of course at that time the mongoose was like <clears throat> one of the top bikes. Yeah, I had like twelve of them. So literally just for sports. So I, so did it make you change your behavior? Did you then did you stop stealing bikes after that and kind of shift to the gym or? Yeah, no, that changed my mind because I had no reason. Right. Like normally I had a reason for doing something. Yeah. But now the gym came along. Like I said, I got in trouble from nine years old. Well, you know, at that time you didn't have Nintendo and all that stuff in your yeah. room. I had posters in my bed. Right. <laughs> so I found a little orange book and it had exercises in it. Okay. And from that, I would just read this book and do those exercises. And I wanted to dunk on people because my guy was uh, Dominique Wilkins. Okay. So that's why I liked. So I know yeah. every time I watched Dominique, he was just just thunders Dunk. to the, yeah. he was just dunking on people. Like, yeah. and that's all I wanted to do. Yeah. So I would jump around my room, jump and try to hit my head on the ceiling. Um, I would do all these exercises because I had a bunk bed so I could curl myself up. I could pull myself up. I had nothing to do. And my mother was pretty strict and disciplined, but it wasn't no, hey, ma, can I do this? It was yeah. like, no, you're staying in your room from when you come out of side from school and you don't leave unless you got to use the bathroom or right. come and eat. I'd like to thank United Charitable for sponsoring today's Inspire Changemakers podcast. United Charitable is a national nonprofit that focuses on guiding you on your charitable journey. Whether you like to simply streamline your giving or you like to create your own charitable initiative, United Charitable has the knowledge and resources to support you. If you'd like to learn more, check out the link in our bio. And so did that kind of also then twofold, and we'll get to the Finding Me Foundation, but did that kind of twofold your love of reading is what information you got from it? Um, the love of reading came from National Geographic. Okay. Because of the colors and the animals. I wanted to be a um, veterinarian or a zoologist, so I was infatuated. I'm still infatuated with animals. It's just the fact that I know they're dangerous now. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm not going to go up to a right. zebra, yeah. Well, so it's just I wanted to know the names of these animals and why I didn't see these animals. And mm. where can I get to these animals? Okay. So then you start getting into Latin because they're named after, you know, the, most of the names are Latin. Okay. The actual names of the animals. Um, and I would just keep reading them. And I'm like, what is that? And then I would try to search and find. And then I would read dictionaries. Okay. Um, so for passion for reading came from National Geographic, trying to figure out why all these animals and why don't they live in my neighborhood. <laughs> and then, so now you're, again, nine years old. You're getting into the gym. You're getting into all this stuff. When well, the did gym was 15. 15. Yeah, yeah. Okay. When did you think or did you ever think that you were going to be a, a college athlete and then a professional athlete? Um, I would say at 12. So at, at 12 is when I decided I was going to go to college. Um, see, none of my parents went to college. My, I could um, pardon for my father. My father went to college. He didn't finish because yeah. he, he makes a point that I say this. And I went to my goal was to go to college, yeah. get a degree because none of my parents had, or nobody in my family had done it. And so what made you pick Delaware State? I didn't, I walked on. Tell me what that means. Um, basically, nobody recruited me. Um, I showed up to the school and said, hey, I'm Donarian McCants, um, are you willing to let me play on your football team? Right, so how that worked was basically- And you got them to pay for it? Yes. Okay. Well, like I said, I was 17, 6'2", 190 pounds. Yeah. Size, speed, and talent. But why Delaware State? Uh, cause that's where my stepdad took me. <laughs> I mean, it's, those were the ones who said they had the money. Really? Yeah. So, so you didn't look at Howard, or you didn't look at like anywhere so local, Baltimore. Me, yeah. So that means like I gave you the story now. Yeah. So that's why I said it might take longer than thirty minutes. Okay, let's go. <laughs> so my situation was like I said, I went to three different high schools, so I didn't know about the transcript. I didn't know about core classes. I didn't know about the clearinghouse. Got it. None of my parents went to went to college. Right. Uh, my brother did, my stepbrother did, but yeah. he went the academic route. He was a straight A student right. forever. Right. Um, so straight A, you just pay for it or you get a loan and you can yeah. go, right? It's, there's no real requirements. So it wasn't almost until midway through my senior year where my counselor was like, hey, you're not graduating, what are you gonna do? I'm like, what you mean I'm not graduating? And he was like, well, you don't have a, the GPA. And I was like, okay, well, I went to three high schools, let me get my transcripts. So my transcript said I had already graduated. Oh, wow. So I'd actually graduated a whole, I think, a semester or, yeah, yeah, I only needed, I didn't need anything to be yeah. in high school. Yeah. But I didn't have, I couldn't do work study because I didn't have um, a license. Right. Um, so I had to just stay in school. Yeah. And then they was like, well, you want to play sports? Did you do the clearinghouse? And I was like, what's the clearinghouse? So I didn't get all this stuff situated to almost May or June. Okay. So you didn't have a lot of time. No. So when we went to the different schools, they yeah. were like, well, we never heard of you because I wasn't a football guy. Right. 
uh, the biggest university that was looking at me for basketball was um, University of Dayton. Yeah. But what I found out, Coach Oliver, he was actually a local guy. Yeah. He had been watching me. And he oh. wanted to bring me up. But when they sent me the paper, um, a guy on the university had passed away. He was a center, and he was supposed to go pro. He had passed away from a heart issue. And they was like, dude, we got to bring in three forwards just to replace this one guy. Crazy. And they sent me a list of all the guys they were bringing in. It was five guys on that list that were just like me. Really? I was about 12 and 14, so 12 points, 14 yeah. rebounds, or 14 points and 12 rebounds per game. So that was pretty much my average. Okay. Um, it was five guys on the list with the same average. So then, see, this is how I know the universe. This is just makes me believe so much that the universe puts us exactly in the right place at the right time to accomplish something, right? Of course. So you walk on and you say, hi, I'm Darnarian McCants. Um, I'm going to play football here and you're going to pay for it. Yes. That was okay. pretty much what happened. My stepdad, was, you know, we had the VHS. Yeah. He didn't say that. He was like, hey, how y'all doing? This is my son, Darnarian. He pops in the tape. He takes their tape out <laughs> and pops in. And it's just so ironic that, yeah. like I said, all the coaches were in the room. The head coach and all the position coaches. That's crazy. So he pops in my tape and press play and they all got quiet. Did you always play wide receiver? <clears throat> um, and, well, I played different levels. So JV, I played two years in varsity one year. So I played wherever they needed me. So coming okay. from small, Howard County small, yeah. you don't come off the field. Right. So wherever the best athletes are, you don't come off the field. So okay. I played wherever they put me. And so you go and your freshman year, you played your freshman year. No, they really should Okay. Right. So then you go in your sophomore year. Yeah. And what was it like to play for that university? Um, my first game was six catches, 170 yards, and two touchdowns. It was just what we did. It was just what I was used to. And what wide receiver did you look up to growing up? Oh, Art Monk, Herman Moore, Jerry Rice, Michael Irvin. Oh, my God. Those would be my first ones out of my, my mind. Because of their skill or who they were? Their size. Their size. It, like I said, I'm, when generally a boy is looking for himself. Okay. That's so finding, finding, finding the foundation. The, yeah. A boy is generally looking for somebody, something that looks like me. Okay. So all those guys were 6'1", 6'2", yeah. 180 plus, Yeah. right? They weren't no great route runners, but they were dominant. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to be. And so, and you still you still do a lot of giving back to Delaware State. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's like your home away yeah. from home. All right, that's home. Yeah, home Love of the hornets, baby. And so did you decide that you were going to go pro? What was that journey like for you? That wasn't a decision either. I just... I didn't like losing. I, I wanted to be the best. Yeah. So it wasn't a. Can I ask one question? Between us, do you, when you play like Connect Four with your kids, does that competitive like look on your face come out when you're like facing your you know twelve year old and you're like I'm gonna take you down in this Connect Four game? Like can you like can you lose no. to them? Oh yeah, no. The board games is it's, it's a different it's a di different mechanism. Okay. So board games, I've never been a board game like. I have to be. It's so you physical. can lose at Uno. I just want to make sure that, like, you, yeah, yeah, your yeah. daughter beating yeah, you. Yeah, no, Uno, I'm, I'm not. I'm not Kobe well. Bryant, Michael Jordan competitive, <laughs> where they got to beat you and everything. No, I'm not that competitive. Okay. So now you're in. You're coming out of Delaware State. Did you know that the professional route was what you were gonna? Were you gonna try for it? No, I was ready to graduate and go work. So that's that's why my, my, my best friend doesn't like me because I I want I don't want to say I didn't try, but it wasn't. A direct, it wasn't a thought like, hey, I'm going pro. My junior year, I didn't even play. They didn't play me. So it wasn't until my senior year when that group had got fired. And I ended up being a leading, you know, I led the, touch, touch, led the nation in touchdowns. I've been the same kid. They just didn't play me. What before. year was that? Uh, what was that, 95? Okay. Hey, oh, not 95. Uh, no, I had to be closer to 99. Okay. All right. And so, so you led? I led the nation in touchdowns. Right. And did you want to, so now, did you grow up, you grew up a Baltimore fan? No, not really. Um, if anything, like I said, I, I was I was a bandwagon rider. Who, whoever was hot, that's who I rolled with. 49ers was hot, that's who I'm with. Cowboys is hot, that's who I'm with. God, um, Raiders, real men wear black, I had the t-shirt. Yeah. It, so whoever was, I was a bandwagon rider. So then you get a call, you get an eight. How did the professional journey go for you? So... The, the senior year wrap up, like I said, so I needed to finish my senior year with six, six, uh, six credits. So that was just my thesis. Right. I'm an art major. 
um, education major. So I just had to, to finish my thesis. And my mom, this woman who didn't want me to go to college, says, go play your senior year. Because I was ready, I was like, I just gotta turn in my thesis and yeah. I'm done. And they was like, go play your senior year. So once again, I found myself in the same position as high school. I was done school. I had right. six credits. Yeah. So I'd make up some other classes to take yeah. for my senior year. Um, and then everything's happened. So I told the coach, I was like, if because it's a new coach, he doesn't know who I am. I right. had no stats my junior year. Right. And he says, and I go to him, I was like, dude, if you give me a scholarship, you keep me on the team, we gonna win. And he said, I've never had a student talk to me like that before. And I was like, you throw me the ball, we'll win. The four games that we lost, I'm gonna say two of them, they didn't throw me the ball. The other two, we just got whooped. Yeah. But two of them, they should have threw me the ball. Okay. And I think we have a different outcome. But we had ended up with a winning season, we went seven and four. Um, and that was my senior year. And then that's when they started coming, knocking on the door, scouts started coming. Um, and people don't understand when scouts come, they're not coming for football. They're coming to find out the character. Right. Yeah. The fir first guy from Cleveland, he asked me, how many baby mamas did I have? How many dogs do I have? And I didn't, th I didn't understand. So I just walked away from him. Yeah, like I said, my, I had all three phone calls from PG County to come work as, as, a, as a teacher. Yeah. So I, they said, hey, we'll give you a hood house. Didn't know what that was. Yeah. Um, and $30,000 to start you off so you can get going yeah. in life. I didn't know what that was. My biggest check was $200. So 30000 sounded pretty good. Right. You know, then when the NFL called, I think that sounded better. And so you get drafted in the fifth round. Yes. For the Redskins. Commanders. My bad. Um, and what was that feeling like for you? I'm going to say it was normal. It was expected. Because, like I said, I had worked myself to the point where it was just more athletics. Yeah. Now, my thought process was now I don't have to read these books about astronomy and classes I could care less about. Right. Now it's about something that I'm trying to get better at and be the best at. Right. So I'm going to say it was exciting, like when I got the phone call, because everybody was like, hey, just expect no free agency. And I'm like, whatever that means, I don't care. Just let me play ball. That was my whole thing. Open up the door and let me play ball. And <clears throat> really, you've decided to use your platform as a professional athlete, even back then, to introduce philanthropy. So tell me, while I'm Peyton, man of the year, what was that like for you? That was, I think, I want to say my first or second year. So each year that I was in the league, I got some kind of community service award. And I was just the only ones I could remember. It was nature. It's natural. Um, now, what I saw was the difference between the commanders, the Redskins at the time, and the Eagles was when we would play the Eagles, all their top athletes had foundations. Yes. And I couldn't figure out why the Redskins didn't have foundations. So when I went to go talk to them, it was just their foundation, and I could join with them, but I couldn't start my own. What Philadelphia Eagle player gave you your worst hit? No, I'm kidding. It was my freshman. Now, this is my rookie year and my shoe had started to slide off. They gave me these ugly Reeboks. Yes, I'm destroying Reeboks. But he, they Isn't gave me- is that your brand though? Like... No, no, I'm Adidas. Oh, that's and, right, Adidas, yeah. yeah. No. No I, Nike. No, no. But I had these Reeboks on and they started sliding on my feet and Al punched me in my chest and my shoe flew <laughs> that way. And the only thing I could say to him, I wasn't even mad. I was like, that's gonna look bad on film. <laughs> And the coach killed me that week. He was like, D-Mac, that's you? Is that your shoe? And I was like, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was probably the worst. I forgot, I forgot his last name, but you remember Al, he played DB. But um, yeah, that, that year they had one of the top, uh, their, their whole secondary was all pro. Yeah. Dawkins, Vincent. Oh, my, um, my little, you saw my autograph from Bobby Taylor, right? Yeah. My favorite player. Yeah, yeah, so. Um, but. So and so really, so it was the Eagles that you saw all of them having their own foundations that you were like, okay, what is this philanthropy? How do I get involved in a real way? All right. So at the Redskins, I was I did the Redskins read. I did everything with them. Yeah. So anytime there was a community service event, I was out. Yeah. I was with them. So that's always been a part of me. I I was trying to start my own early. Yeah. But everybody kept deterring me from it. Right. So everybody was like, no, you got to just concentrate on football. Yeah. Just stay football. Just, and I'm like, dude. Football ain't everything. Like, I'm using this platform to affect people because cause I can catch a football. People are looking up to me. Right. So that means I need to help them in a different way. And what kind of help did you want to provide? Um, just being seen. 
Um, I know one of my stories is I went to the Art Monk camp and a kid showed me his drawing. And I was like, oh, it's pretty good, because everybody knew I was an artist. So yeah. they had put in the paper, on the, I was yeah. an artist, they put in the news, I was an artist. Yeah. So it started affecting these kids. And this one kid at seven, he said he came to the camp and he had said something to me, and I didn't remember him at seven. The next time I saw him, he was 11. And he showed me this drawing. It was the fact that I was a heterosexual male that could draw. Right. His uncle had told him he was gay because he liked art. Mm. So that right there, I know affected that young man. Right. Another situation, um, some redhead kid I was talking to didn't know he was the son of the mayor at the time. And he, I got a letter, and they was like, yeah, anything you need, I wish I would have used and understood my platform at the time. But right. I got a note from the mayor saying, hey, you talked to my son. He fell in love with you. Anything you need, call me. Simply because I don't even know who the kid was. I don't remember who I talked to. But the fact that I was just being me and talking to him like he was a person affected him. I would like to thank Athletes Charitable for sponsoring today's Inspired Changemakers podcast. Athletes Charitable offers a concierge membership service that provides the tools and resources to build a legacy through service. Our athlete-led team has the first-hand experience and expertise to provide hands-on support that simplifies the entire process for athletes and entertainers to reach their social entrepreneurship goals and create lasting impact in their communities. To learn more, check out the link in the bio. You always have had a good way about you of understanding what your platform could be used for. How would you like to affect change moving forward? Um, like I said, with my foundation, is based on literacy. Mm-hmm. Right now, you see teachers on IG and TikTok talking about how they have 7th, 8th graders reading on a 4th and 5th grade level, and these are at the well-to-do schools. Right. So what do you think is happening in the city? Right. Um, so for me, if you can read, write, and comprehend, now we have a conversation it's a different conversation. Right. I'm not speaking above your head. You're not. You're understanding what I'm saying. And then moving forward, far as our society, if these kids can't read, write, and comprehend, how are they gonna fill out resumes? How are they gonna build businesses? That plays a major factor if we have a majority that's falling off to the wayside because they can't do the basics. So the purpose of my foundation was to catch them. It says statistically, mm-hmm. all we got to do is catch them by fourth grade. Right. That's eight or nine years old. Right. And that's it. Like, to me, that doesn't sound like much work. If we just dedicate that time and that will help them move forward. So then you moved from being a professional athlete and then we went through some transition. And what was your next step? What was your after you were a professional athlete? Uh, fell into personal training. So once again... I'm in the gym, working at Gold's Gym, and a uh, big guy comes up to me, hey man, you know, I'm from the streets, uh, but my son is a wide receiver. He's taken his, his family from New York because he was about to get in trouble and brought them to Ashburn. And his son is athlete, and obviously he doesn't want his son to go into the same world he went yeah. into. So I'm training about 13 kids from Broadwoods, and then I get a phone call after the season, like, hey coach, are you doing that camp again? I'm like, what camp? I was just outside playing with kids. <laughs> I, I was like, I knew stuff now. So yeah. it wasn't like, hey, let's just play a game. Yeah. It was like, all right, you need to work on this. You need to work. And I could see it. Yeah. And I could see who had talent, regardless of their size. Yeah. And sp- your foot, your feet, your feet work good. Your hands are good. Your eyes. Like I could tell them what they were. And then they would build confidence off of it. Yeah. And then all of them ended up playing pretty well. So then after that, I had to start a business. Right. And that's when I started my business, a personal training. And first, I just started off with with athletes um and then and then it was it kind of they kind of blend because then the mother was like hey do you do you train adults do you train old people and i'm like yeah i train anybody who wants to learn how to you know be fit and that's what it came down to so do you remember meeting me yes <laughs> yes you walked up to me like i said it but that's where you if you believe in the universe or anything greater mm, absolutely you were what i was looking for right because i had I think 2005, like I said, that was my last year with the Eagles, and I was trying to start my, uh, my, I guess, my own company or, you know. Foundation. Foundation, that's what I'm yeah. looking for. And I, I saw you pre- pre- previously, but you would just kind of do your thing, so I didn't yeah. say anything to you. Um, but then you came up to me. I was like, do you remember? 
Hey. I was like, teach me how to use this machine. And you were like, no, just squat normally. You're like, you don't need a fancy machine, just right. squat. Well, a lot of it, it, a lot of the machines were based off people who did, who had disabilities. That's what right. people don't understand. Right. The military made these machines for people who came back with missing body parts. So you don't need machines unless you're missing a body part or it's actually for rehab. Right. From, you know, understanding kinetics. And so you actually met me before I was the CEO of the company, before I started Athletes Charitable, before yes. I've done a lot of it. Yes. Um, I would like to think I'm the spark <laughs> that started Athletes Charitable. Um, no, definitely. I don't know if I would have had enough. Because, you know, I deal with, like, a lot of, like, no, nah, I don't really, like, what, how am I, like, how, who am I? Like, how am I going to get, you know, now, look at Athletes Charitable. Because you got, like, 12, 14 athletes? Something? 30. Oh, you have 30. I missed a couple then. Yeah, okay. a little bit. Um, and, and, but all of it, though, like, talking about the universe, and you, you kept saying, Julia, I want to do more. How? And that's kind of when the Finding Me Athletes Charitable, the whole thing started to really go into place because again, you were saying in all of your five years of playing, you were discouraged from starting your own foundation or there was no real steps for you. Right, it's organization. Like my, like I tried to explain to my wife, I'm the talent. You're the talent. I need organization. Right. Because it doesn't function in my yeah. head. Like I can see the big picture. Yeah. I know what I want. But those first two, three, four, five steps to get that's the toughest part for me. Do you remember what I said to you when I said I want to start a professional? Do you remember your answer to me when I said? The actual answer, no. I said, I said to you, I go, darn Aaron, I think you know, I'm going to have to make a big swing as the CEO. And now the CEO, and I have to introduce this to my board, I think I'm going to start a professional athletes division. I was like, but I have no contacts. I was like, don't really know where to go with this. And I was like, so am I crazy? And you go, you only live once. Okay. Yeah, like, I'm pretty straightforward and blunt. You're like, y what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, you like, say no. It, it doesn't work. <laughs> and now, did you say? I mean, really, let's be honest of why I started Athletes Charitable. It's because I wanted to meet Philadelphia Eagles players, and now hey. I just met AJ Brown, so we're done. Hey, it's right. Good. It's full it's circle right. now. Full circle. Right. Um, but no, I really, again, when you talk about inspiring change makers and somebody that really does believe that other people can f get exactly what they work for, you are a big component of that. And so I personally appreciate you very, very much. Um, but finding me, what do you want it to accomplish? What are your next fundraising activities? What's coming up in the next year? I got to get reorganized. So like I said, uh, our situation, we tried to launch and COVID hit. Um, and the people I had have lives. So, you know, it became a very strange situation because a lot of people were passing away. Um, and like I was saying before, it was people that were younger than us that were dying. Um, so people kind of drew in a lot, mm -hmm. in my personal opinion, even myself, um, because it was like, okay, that person's younger than me. That person's younger than me. That person's my age. I play ball with him. I play ball with him. It's like, where are these, why are these people disappearing from this planet? Um, so I think personally it messed me up. Um, right. And then I know uh, medically I went into a depression. Um, so that was new because that's a battle I haven't fought before. And are you were you still trained personal training at this time? Um, sorta of, kinda, but everybody was away from each other. Right. So yeah. there was nobody. So I call it hibernation mode. So what I was doing is actually a hypersomnia. I was sleeping seventeen, eighteen hours a day. Yeah. So I would wake up to go to sleep. So I would get online because I was I was in the school system by this time. Yeah. Get online with the kids and then immediately fall asleep. I knew my time, I was supposed to get back up, I had my alarm clock set, get back online, whatever the kids had to do, and immediately go to sleep. And I would just sleep all day, and then it was time to get back up, or I would wake up to go upstairs to yeah. go back to sleep. So I did this almost a year. Um, and then, like I said, I couldn't figure out what was going on. And this, my, is, and this is really the first time in your life that you've ever really felt that depression. I didn't know what it was. I, I just knew I, I, I called it my radio. So I would be deemed ADHD, Right. Where, bing, 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 bing. Hey, this needs to go. Last time. Like, right. that's how my brain was normally functioning. It was like turning the radio back in the 80s. Well, but today yeah. is. You know, it was a lot like that as far as my brain. Now it's like, there's no thought process. There's no, hey, let's do this. Hey, let's do this. Let me call this person. Let me talk to this person. Hey, let's see if we can get this done. 
Now it's like, all right, I know what I have to do. Let's do it. <laughs> so then how did you fight yourself out of that? I'm still fighting because now it's like I said, it's I can say it's coming back where I can sit in the car and I'll have thoughts of songs. So like I always, song is up, you say a word, Yeah. I got a song for it. Even if it's another person's song. But because we missed that whole part of your background that you are a recording artist. <laughs> yes. I remember, what, what's the name of the song? Baby? Yeah, Baby Baby. Yeah, that you can find on YouTube as well. Yeah, you can find everything on, on YouTube. Um, but yeah, I mean, so <laughs> the plethora of all the things, and then you decided to kind of leave personal training or kind of do it more on the side yeah. because you wanted to give back more. Well, I wanted to get, I, I was just getting in touch with athletes and I wasn't getting in touch with females. So I had my girls, I had my track team, but I, I just felt it was, I was, what about the regular kid? Right. The regular kid that doesn't see a black male in the school. Right. Um, so that's where my thought process went and my thought process took me to the school system. And where are you teaching now? Uh, right now I'm at Westfield High School. Okay. Mm -hmm. Special education. And you love it? Oh yeah. Well, like I said, it's I'm, I'm grabbing those kids who would never have seen me. Right. Because the teacher, what do you, what did, what did you say to him? What did, he respects you? I look like him. Right. That's a real factor. Right. Like people don't understand because not everybody has a brother, not everybody has a father or uncle right. that they can say, hey, he kind of reminds me of myself and he, the tones. Like I try to explain to women, I'm like, my tone is different. So when they hear my voice, it's a different response. Like talking to kids. When you talk to a kid, hey, how you want to look at the baby? Yeah. I, I. We don't talk to each other like that. Right. We're no monotone. So it comes the same way to a boy. When they hear this big, deep bass of a voice, well, how am I, how am I supposed to respond? Right. I'm, I, I think I should listen. Right. <laughs> you know, it, I, they know I can't touch them. They know right. I can't do nothing physically to them. Yeah. I could, but I can't. Right. <laughs> so the possibility, but, you know, they don't necessarily disrespect me and like I said I don't go into the disrespect them I don't pull a power struggle like hey you should be you know I just let them be themselves and try to once again just guide them coach um so tell me again finding me foundation you your goal is to really put books in the hands of kids yes we I want men reading to young men so they can see that reading is cool right. I want professional men in front of young men to see more than just somebody who can catch a football. Right. I did. I never thought of catching a football as being great. Knowing what I know now and understanding that it's actually a genius behind it, because not everybody can do it. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of the truth, isn't it? It's, 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 a little bit of the truth. Yeah. But awesome. Well, Darnarian, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. And if anybody wanted to check out any more information, it's findingme.org is where you can find more information about the Darnarian McCants Foundation and also follow him on all of his socials. And he'll, he'll greet you every morning with, it's, it's a, a great, great day, day to, to be alive. Awesome. Thanks, McCants. All right. Find inspired change makers on Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn and comment on all the awesome things you are doing to make this world a better place. Don't forget to subscribe.